2024 will be the year of curated chaos in SpaceX's Starship program. The chaos reflects the way Starship will break the normal rules in basic physics as well as the aerospace industry to go into the extremely developing zone. The word curated proves that chaos is something that is part of SpaceX's calculations and long-term strategy, not something that cannot be controlled. If the first signs of that were only slightly revealed in Flight 3, then Flight 4 onwards will be when everything will be much clearer. Find out everything in today's episode of TechMap. Recently, SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk revealed the goals for the next Starship mission, which is expected to take place in early May and will focus on bringing the craft back to Earth safely from orbit for the first time. Goal of this mission is for Starship to get through max re-entry heating with all systems functioning. This was also mentioned previously by Gwen Shotwell, president and COO of SpaceX. I think we're really going to focus on getting re-entry right. The maximum re-entry heating experienced by the Starship rocket during its atmospheric re-entry can vary depending on factors such as entry angle, velocity, and atmospheric conditions. As we see in Flight 3, both stages of Starship had the burning re-entry. Although the booster didn't reach extreme velocities like the upper stage, through SpaceX's animation video, it is still enveloped by plasma during this phase. As a result, the Raptor engine must also suffer intense heat from this. Until now, I don't see any speculation as to whether plasma was a contributing factor in booster's issue, but I'm pretty sure they have to consider this phenomenon in the next flight. Elon's tweet also hinted that plasma would be a potential danger to the system's normal operation, to reduce the risk, they can adjust the booster's speed more appropriately during landing, for example. Indeed, B-10 failed in a soft landing due to its landing velocity. In my analysis of the video SpaceX new design changes on Ship 29 and Booster 11 after Starship Flight 3, I put forward my theory that a problem with the grid fin resulted in the B-10's excessively high landing speed. In the comments section, many people commented on their thoughts, Someone said that the wide-angle sweep of the grid fins looks like a software or hardware problem rather than a grid fin aerodynamic problem. Beyond 15 degrees to the apparent wind-wind angle with respect to the fin flat surface, turbulence begins spoiling the lifting effect of the fin. The grid reduces that angle in some cases because of the congregation of 90-degree aligned surfaces, squares. The other opposed, saying grid fin is not a problem. Looking at the footage, at a 48-kilometer altitude, then grid fins went active, jerked to life as electrically the motor drivers were turned on. They operated nominally until they hit the cloud at exactly 5 kilometers, where the gain schedule jumped to the higher gain for dynamic control. This would not have been an issue of the motor's head Raptor 13 motors, fired earlier to slow down the rocket, where you do need the higher gains in order to have more maneuverability at slower subsonic speeds. The grid fins, flat on top and pointy on the bottom, are designed to handle hypersonic and faster speeds all the way down to low air speed in the subsonic range during the landing phase. Once again, my sincerest thanks to the viewers who watched my videos and left interesting and useful comments. That helps me and other viewers have a deeper insight into the content of the video. And if you also want your opinion to be quoted in our next videos, don't hesitate to leave a like button, subscribe button, and comment right below this video. Okay, let's go back. Compared to Super Heavy, the max re-entry heating on Starship's upper stage is much more challenging. Therefore, SpaceX has designed the Starship with advanced heat shield materials and thermal protection systems to withstand the intense heat generated during re-entry. During re-entry, the upper stage can achieve supersonic speed five times the speed of sound. Thus, the company has conducted extensive testing and simulations to ensure that the Starship's heat shield can effectively manage the heat flux experienced during re-entry. This heat shield is crucial for protecting the vehicle and any payload during its return to Earth or entry into other atmospheres, such as those of Mars or the Moon. Despite losing a few heat tiles during liftoff, this minor damage likely wasn't the catalyst for Ship 28's demise. In any case, no spacecraft, even with properly placed bricks, could withstand such conditions, but we cannot remove the risk of larger areas on the ship's hull losing the protective layer in the upcoming flights, especially when Starship gets through max re-entry heating. So, what exactly happened to TPS on Ship 28? 
Some were lucky enough to pick up pieces of heat shield after the third flight, and a few people took it for analysis and research. Based on that research, they discovered that the attachment process was likely flawed and not the tiles themselves. If they were fragile, then they should have shattered when found. Apparently, they did not. In addition, these tiles were discovered so soon and so close to the launch site that they were likely shaken loose from the vibrations of launch or soon after from aerodynamic loading. As we know, each tile is fixed to the ship's hull with three fastener pins. These pins are welded to the orbiter's skin and are not likely to easily break off, and only special tools and tricks can unclip them if a clip is designed to unclip. So some strange vibrational modes could be the main culprit because bolts are untightened when under vibration. Still, this usually requires a lot of time. To happen seconds or minutes after launch is indicative of an unknown failure mode or the clip heads of the fasteners are failing or snapping off. The other possibility is that the tiles are attached incorrectly. With 18,000 tiles packed tightly together, it may be difficult to verify the proper installation of every tile. While Booster had a problem with its landing speed, roll issues could explain why Starship struggled with re-entry. The vehicle might have been tumbling or even upside down, at times entering the plasma stream with its engines first. If Ship 29 is expected to do what its predecessor missed in Flight 3, such as relight engine burn in space, the roll issue is required to be dealt with in advance. Starship did not attempt its planned on-orbit relight of a single Raptor engine due to vehicle roll rates during coast. As far as I know, the roll rates of a rocket in space can vary widely depending on several factors including the mission profile, the design of the rocket, and the specific requirements of the mission. Here are some general considerations. Stabilization. Many rockets are equipped with systems to control their orientation, including gyroscopes, reaction control thrusters, and aerodynamic fins. These systems can help maintain a desired orientation and control the roll rate. Mission requirements. The roll rate may be intentionally adjusted during different phases of a mission. For example, during launch, roll maneuvers may be used to orient the rocket for proper trajectory alignment. During coast phases or satellite deployments, the roll rate may be adjusted for specific mission objectives. Payload considerations, the requirements of the payload being carried by the rocket can also influence the roll rate. Some payloads may require a very stable environment, while others may be less sensitive to rotational motion. Environmental factors, external forces such as gravitational gradients, atmospheric drag, if the rocket is in a low orbit, and solar radiation pressure can also influence the roll rate over time. Last but not least, Shotwell declared clearly that there would be no Starlink deployed in the next test. This makes sense. In the latest flight, no visual confirmation during the live stream that the payload bay door had closed. The leakage of pressure could harm the structure's integrity inside. As a result, SpaceX will need to correct the payload door and test it again in Flight 4 in advance. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. If you want to explore more aspects of the world's most powerful rockets and the world of rockets in general, here is a selection of deeper dive videos for you. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time 